Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here in Severo Institute. Welcome aboard. I hope that you know who we are. And this is at least the second, if not the first reason, and I think the first reason are our guests, why you came here and to spend hopefully a pleasant afternoon here in this beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, my name is Ivan Langer. I'm, I know that I do not like, but I'm one of the founder of, of this excellent private college. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome not only you, but also our guest here and then to say uh, just a few words in, in the beginning of our meeting. Uh, there are several words you can find almost on each corner, and we can count all together. Terrorism, migration, security, freedom, solidarity. But I think that, that the word cyber belongs to them definitely. And it's because of we live in so-called time of information or information time. And uh, living in it this time, it means that we solve a very different problem than uh, the problem was solved by our fathers and fathers of our fathers. They lived in the time when it was really a problem to get information. And they saw the problem named how to survive without informations. We are solving different problem. How to survive with informations. And it's because information became a good commodity. Good commodity to be product. I, I see uh, some experts who are selling a, a good product. Uh, it became uh, a good product to be produced, to be sold, even to be stolen. And so that I think that the issue of this conference is uh, very attractive. Uh, I would like to add in the beginning one point of view. Uh, the informations are really important. We cannot live without them. But we should be very cautious because there are a people and, and institutions obviously named the governments who are really hunger to collect the data. And they are telling us that they have to collect all those data about us to protect us. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they don't want to collect all those data against us. I don't want to shock you. I, I, I don't want to be pessimistic. Uh, I hope that, that we are going to enjoy a pleasant afternoon. I hope and I do believe that we will learn more about uh, the world I mentioned in the beginning of my opening speech, the word is cyber. Once again, welcome here. I hope that you who are here for the first time are not here for the last time. I hope that I can and I will meet some of you as a, our students. We have an excellent program and it really doesn't matter how old are you. We work with young, uh, a little bit older, and a little bit older and older students, so you are warmly well welcome. But it's a good time to again welcome our dist distinguished guests and uh, to thank them for, for coming and to give a floor to Alexander Wondra, who is going to be a person who will lead us through this, this afternoon. 
have a pleasant afternoon here in Severa Institute. So, good afternoon, everybody. So, my duty is to moderate uh, this uh, excellent panel here and to introduce uh, the guests and the teams. So, most of all, let me say how glad I am that uh, uh, the writer, uh, famous journalist, and I would also gladly add uh, the friend of mine, Ed Lucas, uh, has accepted uh, the several invitation and to come among us to participate at one of those foreign uh, lecture series here. Uh, you can read about, about uh, Edward, uh, just to mention that he's a long-time uh, senior editor of The Economist. Uh, he was posted in the past uh, in many uh, capitals around uh, Central and Eastern Europe, in Prague, in Warsaw, in the Baltic States, in Moscow. So uh, right now he's one of the few voices, I would say, in the world or Western discourse who is uh, able to uh, defend the interest, uh, I would say, maybe one of the last Mohicans together with Annie Applebaum in this particular area. He's also the writer, uh, author of the four books. Uh, two of those books were translated into the Czech language, so maybe you know them. Uh, the first one, uh, which has appeared in 2008 under the title New Cold War or uh, Nova Studena Valka. It was perhaps the first serious uh, encounter to uh, bring a, a realistic uh, portrait of uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, what, uh, how, and the recommendation that we should take him uh, really seriously and not just looking into his uh, uh, eyes, as was some naive proclamation in the beginning. Uh, his second book from uh, 2011 was also translated uh, uh, into the Czech language, Deception. Uh, I think uh, another pioneer attempt in uh, actualizing the theme of the espionage uh, and the, the new activities of, uh, of the services in an era when many of... Uh, uh, the Western people had the tendency to underestimate uh, the role and activity of uh, those services. Unfortunately, the third uh, book, which was published electronically in, in Kindle on Edward Snowden, uh, was not uh, published uh, in Czech. Uh, but uh, I especially appreciate that book because it was the voice which uh, was very familiar to me, you know, when Edward Snowden has appeared on the world stage. Uh, the classic uh, Western reaction was that he's almost something like a hero, but there was a handful of us, and uh, Ed Lucas was among them, who said that this is the guy who, from the first moment to the, big, to the end, it's uh, mostly uh, the servant of uh, the KGB and uh, should be taken appropriately. Uh, his uh, last book is, uh, could not be translated, but I guess uh, will be one day. Uh, it's called Cyberphobia, so it's uh, uh, a little bit different theme. Uh, the undertitle, Identity, Trust, Security, and uh, the Internet, I think, uh, will tell you what uh, this is all about. And that's also uh, bring uh, to... Uh, commentators to the panel who, after the keynote speech by Ed Lucas, will add their uh, remarks. Alesh Kuchera, uh, uh, one of the leading experts on the e-government and IT business, uh, running the IT center here at the Severo Institute, uh, will, will give his remarks. And Tomáš Poyar, the long-time diplomat, vice president of the Severo College, and also the manager of the MBA program here for cybersecurity management. So we will have both the geopolitical as well as more domestic-oriented uh, response. Uh, 
We have made some small change to uh, marketing this uh, uh, lecture, so we cut the identity and put uh, trust, security, Russia and the internet, with two reasons, because uh, he's an expert on Russia, uh, and secondly, uh, I have to thank also Hans Eidel Stiftung, uh, which has helped us with uh, covering the costs of uh, this uh, event, and originally we were asking them specifically about uh, Russian uh, uh, component of uh, the cybersecurity uh, problem. Uh, but uh, because the book was not published in, in Czech, just let me briefly mention some context. You know, this book is based on a story of a fictional couple named not Chip and Dale, but Chip and Pin, uh, Pin Hackett. <laughs> and uh, the author, Ed Lucas, illustrates on, this, uh, on the story of the everyday life of this couple uh, the everyday challenges with uh, cyber, uh, cyber threats. If there is some key message of the book is that, then it is that no one, neither the governments nor the companies, and mostly nor the individuals, is, no one is safe from cyber attacks and the leaks of information. Uh, we can mention a lot of examples, just to quote from the book, uh, one perfect example. The availability of stolen credit card information is now so common that it can be purchased on the black market for uh, as little as four US dollars with potentially thousands at stake for each victim. From the foreign arena, just three brief examples. We all remember how North Korea, a very poor country, uh, was able to seriously harm uh, Sony Picture and Hollywood in general just last year. Or summer last year, the Russian hackers has placed malicious uh, software into the system of the Polish uh, airlines, the lot company, grounding all flights in and out uh, Chopin Airport in Warsaw. And in fact, when I was looking for some commentators, I was inviting one guy who is uh, very active in, in, in this area in Prague, but unfortunately could not come because he's traveling and abroad. But he promised me to come uh, later this year to tell us how it is easy, you know, to change the GPS and to change the time. Or, uh, last but not least, we all have in a very fresh mind how uh, the emails of the Czech Prime Minister Sobotka has been leaked early this year by hackers and offered to this, uh, offered to the public. So, at the same time, uh, we are daily see how the governments are collecting as much data as any time before. Central registers of banking accounts of the contracts uh, are already in place. The electronic evidence of any uh, business uh, transaction will uh, start uh, soon. And Right now in the parliament, is, they started to discuss the register of all patients and their diseases. So it's easy to harm us. And the common denominator is here that we are already voluntarily giving up the information on us, but we are not getting things in reward that makes us safer. We take the greater precaution to the real world than to the cyberspace, although the latter could produce more devastating effects. Because once the hacker is in your system, it can easily gather any information and track you in every your step. So we all likely saw the, movie, the famous movie uh, Matrix, and remember how Morpheus has warned uh, Neo when 
NEO had to decide whether to take the blue or the red pill. And Morpheus has said, this is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. So, Ed, what is the right pill to take? <laughs> Well, thank you very much indeed, Sasha, for inviting me. It's, um, I think, 26, 27 years since we've been friends, and um, I appreciate very much the chance to come here and to visit uh, Severo. It's, um, and I also thank the Hans Seidel Stiftung for inviting me. I'm, I'm going to try and talk about both Russia and cybersecurity, and you might think this is a rather big stretch because these are very different, um, although very serious, problems. But actually, as I was researching the book Cyberphobia, I found that a great deal of my experience in dealing with Russia and with European security was actually far more relevant than I expected. But perhaps the biggest similarity with these problems is that, on the one hand, people are very surprised on the other hand, these problems are actually not new. We are surprised only because we weren't paying attention. This is true in the sense that right back in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, there were people who were warning us that Russia was going in the wrong direction. They include your former president, Václav Havel, who was gravely concerned about the direction Russia was taking even in the Yeltsin years. The Estonian president, Lennart Meri, gave a speech in 1994 in Hamburg where he outlined with tremendous insight and prescience the way in which Russia was becoming both less democratic at home and more aggressive abroad. The failure to deal with the old legacy of the KGB, the revival of neo-imperialist thinking and the belief that Russia had the right to interfere in other countries' affairs. All the problems that we've seen now under Putin have very deep roots. And people told us about this. Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Poles, um, Czechs and others were all warning the West and the West didn't pay attention. And the people who made those warnings were sometimes ignored, sometimes patronized or belittled told that they were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, that they didn't really understand the bigger picture, and so on. And now the West is really worried about Russia. We are really worried about the extent of Russian espionage. We're worried about the way in which Russian money has penetrated our systems. We're worried about Russian uh, cyber capabilities, both in terms of espionage and in terms of disruption. And we're worried about Russian hard power. We're worried about how do we defend the Baltic states. We failed to react in Estonia in 2007. We failed to defend Georgia in 2008. We failed to defend Ukraine when Ukraine was attacked. But now we face a really difficult military problem um, in defending the Baltic states. And the top people in NATO worry about this all the time. And they don't find any easy answers. But the fact that we're surprised doesn't mean that this was really a surprising event. It's just that we weren't paying attention. And it's very similar um, with the world of computer security. People have been worried for decades about the vulnerability of our computers and networks. There's a brilliant book, I think possibly the best book ever written on computer security, is called Cuckoo's Egg. And it was, by a, it was written by a young researcher called Clifford Stoll, who in the mid-1980s, when he was working at an American university, noticed that someone was using computer time on the academic network and not paying for it. It was just 75 cents was missing. But he was troubled by this, and he started investigating. And the more he investigated, the more worried he became. And he found out, in the end, that this was a bunch of West German hackers who were working for the KGB. They'd made contact with the KGB in East Berlin, and they were using what in those days was the way you got on 
the internet by dialing up a number in Germany and then hopping around from network to network until they reached American academic networks and then going from American academic networks into networks that were dealing with military and with classified stuff to steal American military secrets and bring them to the KGB. And he wrote a book, and, and everything that he discovered then is still a security problem now. The failure to implement proper identity assurance, you don't really know who you're dealing with. People can steal credentials or fake credentials or just get onto the network without credentials at all. The failure to design networks in a way that once an outsider has got onto it, that you can spot them quickly and prevent them doing any damage. The failure to track where the information has gone once it's been stolen. The difficulty of prosecuting and following up when things cross national borders because you can imagine the American telephone companies weren't terribly interested in 1986 in trying to trace calls made from West Germany, and the West German authorities were not very interested in trying to track down a crime, if it really was a crime, that seemed to involve the theft of only 75 cents of computer time. All these problems we had then and we have now, and people like Clifford Stahl and others have been warning about this for years, and at every stage, in the development of the internet and of our computers and networks and hardware and software, we've always put convenience and cost and backwards compatibility and flexibility ahead of security. Because it's always made sense in the short term to say, let's make sure this new stuff works. Much better to have a world with email, even if email is a bit insecure, than to wait for some kind of secure thing to come along and then who knows what we will miss in the meantime. Much better to have new hardware, even if you don't really understand the chip design. Much better to have new software, even if that software incorporates all the mistakes of previous software and nobody really has an overview of how that software is really constructed and whether it's really trustworthy or not. But better to do stuff quickly and get the new stuff going than worry about security. And that has brought us to the legacy, uh, to the position that we're, that we're in now, where there's a real panic about cybersecurity. People are waking up and realizing that they can't keep their customers' data safe, they can't keep their intellectual property safe, they can't keep their suppliers' data safe, they can't keep their employees' data safe, they can't keep their shareholders' data safe, they can't keep anything safe. Nobody can be really confident that they're able to keep um, their most important data safe. And we're seeing that if you don't keep your data safe, you can get into terrible trouble. We've seen what happened with the Sony Pictures hack, which Sasha mentioned. Um, just today, um, I was reading in the paper that the Central Bank of Bangladesh has lost a huge amount of money, which it kept in New York, because someone spoofed its credentials and was able to get the money out of New York and transfer it to the Philippines. So whether you are a private individual or a central bank or a big company or anything in between, you are worried. And are we surprised? Yes, we're surprised. Are we right to be surprised? Well, not really. We just weren't paying attention. Go back and look at all the books and the articles and the speeches that have been given over the last 30 years, and you'll find people warning again and again and again um, this stuff isn't safe. Do we really want to make the internet into the central nervous system of modern life? Because that's what it's become. The people who designed the internet had no idea that this was going to become the way we do our messaging, our entertainment, our banking, our commerce, our infrastructure, our transport, all the other things that we do over the internet. It wasn't designed to be secure. It was designed to be resilient and flexible and innovative and other good things. And now we're stuck where we are. And the second way, so that, that's the first big similarity. We're worried about Russia. We're in a panic about Russia. We're surprised, but we shouldn't be surprised. And we're also in a panic about our computers and networks, but we shouldn't be because we just weren't paying attention. And the second interesting similarity is that in each case, we have a rules-based order, which is meant to be keeping the whole thing going. We have the European Security Order, which dates back to the Helsinki Accords and the um, foundation of the CSCE before the collapse of communism. 
um, but was the beginning of, of, of a kind of collaborative security order. And then the Paris Charter, which followed the collapse of communism, the OSCE, um, all the different arms control arrangements, the NATO-Russia Council, this whole edifice we've built up of European security, all based on the idea that we fundamentally share a common interest. We're all basically interested in the same thing, which is to live peacefully with each other and get on with making money and having fun, because that's what modern civilization is about. And yes, we will have difficulties along the way. Country A will disagree with country B, but we have these rules-based law-governed systems, multilateral organizations and agreements, which will sort things out. And that was a great dream in the 1990s. Even then, I didn't believe it because I said, what happens with countries that don't play along with that? We saw already in 1992 what happened to Moldova. That was a big problem. We saw the collapse of Yugoslavia and the terrible wars and suffering that that brought. We saw the rise of Alexander Lukashenko in Belarus and then all the tendencies in Russia. So it was clear from actually from the get-go that this rules-based multilateral European security order was based on wishful thinking. It was based on an unwillingness to confront the idea that there might be really bad guys out there who wouldn't believe in the same things that we believe in, who would be willing to use force, to take risks, to accept economic pain, to become international pariahs, to lie about what they were doing, to break all the rules because they didn't believe in the rules. And what were we in rules-based um, Europe going to do about that? And actually, it's a bit the same on the Internet. The internet was set up on the basis of trust and goodwill. It was set up by computer scientists who fundamentally, the first thing they wanted to do was to share time on computers. Because in those days, computers were enormous great things that would fill half this space here. Um, only universities and big government institutions had them. Time was very precious and you needed a way of sharing time on computers. And that's when we got our first networks between different geographical locations. We wanted ways of sharing research and of messaging, but it was all based on the idea of a collaborative endeavor where the worst that would happen was that someone might be a little bit mischievous or a little bit careless, but nobody was going to go out and say, I'm here to steal things, to humiliate people, to destroy things, um, to do all the sort of things that we now see happening. The internet now is a paradise for spies, for pranksters and hooligans, hacktivists, for criminals, for hostile foreign governments wanting to um, disrupt our life either in peacetime or even worse at war. But nobody thought of that at the beginning. The rules of the internet are not designed to cope with malefactors. You can't be... <coughs> excuse me. You can't be banned from the internet. It's very hard to see. There's no internet police that collects data about people who are doing things that are bad, and there's no way of imposing penalties on them. <coughs> so that's the second similarity. The first was that these problems have been developing for a long time, and we are surprised, but we shouldn't be surprised. And the second is that we have a rules-based order um, which is based on mistaken assumptions, that everybody is basically um, the same and trying to do things in a nice way. It doesn't cope with, sort of, um, um, the, with, with the real-life problems we face, either with cyber criminals or with people, like, um, with people like Putin. And the third big similarity between the world of worrying about Russia and the world of worrying about cyber is, um, and this may sound a little bit eccentric, but there's one country which gets both of these things right, and that's Estonia. Now, I just wonder, are there any Estonians in the room? Because Estonians hate being embarrassed in public, and they may want to leave, because I'm now going to praise Estonia. Um, but Estonia, I think, got Russia right from the get-go. They were absolutely clear in 1991 that they could not take their regained independence for granted. They immediately started investing in defence, in um, intelligence and security um, agencies of a, very, of a very high quality, making sure they joined every organization that, that would help them with their security and meeting the rules of those organizations. Um, 
they have a very highly developed security culture of a kind that you don't really come across in um, many European countries. You see it a little bit in somewhere like Norway. Um, you see it a little bit in, in Britain and in America. But an idea that everybody in the country, whether they're a businessman or a journalist or a politician or a spy or a civil servant or in civil society, everybody knows they face a common threat. Everybody knows you have to cooperate. You can't put your own private interests ahead of um, everybody else's. You may have to um, break down barriers, talk to people you don't normally talk to, because if you don't, the other side's going to get you. And that's been baked in to the way Estonia um, runs itself um, since, the, since the early 90s and is one of the reasons, I think, why they've been doing, um, why they do so well. But the other thing, which they're also very good at, is dealing with data and networks and security. And the foundation of this system is, it has two elements. One is very strong cryptographically based identity. Because one of the great problems on the internet is you don't really know who you're dealing with. You could get an email which said from edwardlucas at gmail.com or edward.lucas at gmail.com or edward underscore lucas at gmail.com and it might say nice meeting you in Prague please find some pictures of the event and you would think well that must be from Edward Lucas because it's Edward Lucas at gmail.com but actually it's not there's some other people out there who've got those Edward Lucas addresses but we instantly trust an email address just by looking at it we think we can tell that must be right um, to test this theory, I set up an email, and I wrote about this in the book, of russian.embassy.london at gmail.com. And I then started sending to six carefully selected targets. I wrote letters, um, emails, pretending to be from Mr. Ivanov at the Russian embassy in London, um, making some slightly mischievous points, warning them against meeting Edward Lucas because it would be bad for their future health. Um, and doing things that, if they'd been reading just a little bit critically, they'd have think, why is the Russian embassy in London using a Gmail address, please? And is this Ivanov guy really serious? But I, I copied and pasted from the Russian embassy website the logos and um, you know, all the kind of you know, crests and things. So it kind of looked at, all right. And I thought every one of the, this included a NATO ambassador, um, and I won't mention the country concerned because I have many... Um, friends there, and I don't want to embarrass, um, embarrass them. It wasn't the Czech Republic, by the way. Um, I said a professor dealing with Russian studies, um, a um, retired intelligence officer, um, a senior journalistic colleague, and a, um, a, couple, a couple of other people. Every single one of them believed that this came from the Russian embassy. The NATO ambassador was so worried that um, he sent the email to the security officer at his embassy who then sent it to the um, headquarters in the home country, saying it's absolutely, absolutely clear that the Russian embassy in London is bugging our meetings, and we have to do something about it. And this, this all happened in the space, but about three hours later, I thought, okay, I've had my fun, and I, I then phoned up and said, did you just get an email from the Russian embassy? Every one of those six people believed it was an email from the Russian embassy, and they'd taken it completely seriously. And that was a highly above average um, target um, target audience. So we don't know who we are on the internet. We don't know who we're dealing with. And that is, and, and yet the, the ability to deal in a trusting and cooperative way with people we don't know very well is the absolute foundation of civilization. That's how we move from the village to the town, from a subsistence economy and a barter economy to having money and doing business over long distances. Because we have ways of making sure that the people we're dealing with really are the people we think they are. And you can't do that on the internet because you can spoof emails, you can set up fake Twitter accounts, you can set up fake Facebook pages. You can intercept a real email and send an email that looks as though it actually comes from your friend's email, which you know is his email. You can do all this stuff, it's really easy. You can send an SMS. I got, just as an example in my book, um, I have a friend who's a hacker called Kevin Mitnick and he was able to send me a text message that looked as if it came from a member of the British royal family 
and the message said, Hi, Edward, please give Kevin all my passwords. <laughs> now, it so happened, I just do, by pure coincidence, I do actually know someone who's a member of the royal family. Now, if I got an SMS from them saying, this is so-and-so, and please give, I, I would take that. And he was able to send that SMS from his laptop, sitting opposite me, just by fiddling. So, we, so identity is really weak on the internet. And that's why the Estonian system is so important, because every Estonian, um, every resident of Estonia, gets a, an ID card, which has a strong cryptographically based identity that with data that only they know, the PIN number to identify themselves, a PIN number to authenticate themselves. And with that, you can actually prove who you are. You can prove who you are when you're doing business. You can send an email that can only have come from you. You can send a document that only the other person can read. If there was an Estonian here in the audience, I would be able to demonstrate this. An Estonian would tell me his public key, which is basically the date of birth and the, the, the sequence in which where he was born on that day. And if I know that Estonian's public key, I can encrypt a message and send it, and only he, with his private key, can open, can, can open that message. That is a quantum leap away from the sort of insecurity that we have, um, for, for, you know, the rest of us have. The other thing which is really important in Estonia is there is no single point of vulnerability. Now, I was talking before this, um, this, this lecture about what I understand is the proposal from the Czech government to set up lots of big national databases. Big national databases are a terrible idea because once you get in, and a good attacker will always get in, once you steal the, the key, and a good attacker will be able to steal the key, you'll be able to get in and steal huge lumps of data. So it's much better to have distributed databases, not have a single big database. And then, of course, the question is, how do they talk to each other? And that's where the Estonians have another brilliant system, which is called the X-Road. And the X-Road is like a federation of databases. And when you need to check something, say you want to see, is Edward Lucas old enough to buy alcohol? Yeah, I'm ordering some alcohol online. And the alcohol retailer wants to check, is Edward Lucas old enough to buy alcohol? Now, in our system, Edward Lucas would give away his date of birth, and that would then be checked against some vast national registry of dates of birth. And that's bad for two reasons. First of all, because you shouldn't use immutable personal data for identification, because once it's stolen, someone else can use it, and you can never get a new date of birth, just like you can never get a new social security number or anything like that. But, but secondly, because that, holding all that data on a central database makes it easy to be stolen. So what the Estonian system does is it says, it doesn't say what's Edward Lucas' date of birth, it just says, is Edward Lucas over 21 or over 18, or whatever the age is? And that's queried against whatever the local database is where I'm registered, me as an Estonian citizen, and it says either yes or no. So none of this valuable data chases hands. All you find out is Edward Lucas is the right age to do things. So I think this combination of a federative um, database with no single point of, of vulnerability and a very strong cryptographically based ID system where you can prove who you are and also prove who the other people are that you're dealing with um, gets us out of a lot of the problems we have in cybersecurity. It doesn't deal with all of them. We still have a horrendous problem of the broken system of security certificates. Um, we take security certificates on trust. We think that when we go to a website and there's a little padlock there and it says HTTPS, that's going to be okay. Well, no, it isn't because those certificates are going to be spoofed and some of the people who issue those certificates are really, really dodgy. So it doesn't really tell you um, as much as you think it does if, you, if, if the security certificate um, comes up okay on your browser. And there are, we still have horrendous problems with um, the way in which our... Uh, other people, man people manage databases that we don't know about that have our data on them. And um, I could go on at length about all the other things. But at least these two of these things can be solved. And I'll finish up by saying I think that the, perhaps the fourth thing where the, these coincide is that Russia's attack on the West happens very largely over the internet. Russia is attacking us all the time with propaganda. And where are these propaganda stations? RT, Sputnik, these other things. Well, they're mostly not 
old-fashioned broadcast television stations. They're mostly broadcasting over the internet. Um, the inability to check things properly, to spread disinformation over these is absolutely tailor-made um, for the internet. And Russia has been really good at taking its old disinformation techniques in the 70s and 80s, which they were very, very good at, and adapting them for the, um, for the internet age. Russia's also really good at finding things out over the internet by cyber espionage. It's also got very powerful capabilities in terms of cyber warfare, as we saw in Ukraine just the other day, where they brought down the Ukrainian power grid in a really serious state-to-state -state, um, cyber attack. So I'll stop there. I hope I've cheered you all up um, with this happy talk about how everything is going so well. I look forward to my responses from my two fellow panelists and also to questions from the floor. And thank you again, once, once again, Sasha, dear Sasha, very much for inviting me. Well, I will now pass the floor to, uh, to Alesh Kuchera and maybe we'll uh, start this with a question to him. Uh, one of the Ed's uh, uh, thesis was that, you know, we have always preferred the comfort over security. And this is uh, one source of our vulnerability. So what is the right pill? Uh, it's uh, more security to add into the system, can it fix that? Or uh, uh, to offer less information? <laughs> what, what is the solution? Good morning, ladies and abych se podíval na problém z domácího úhlu pohledu, a tak budu mluvit česky, abych dodal konferenci mezinárodní rozměr, když tak dejte sluchátka sousedovi. Na chlás. To co, píše, to, co píše pan Lukas v úvodu té svojí knihy, já bych se to dovolil takřka citovat. Objevila se to má prezentace, zcela báječný. To vzdělání a ta doba nám prostě dala velice do, dobrý, dobrý cit balancovat to riziko a balancovat to pohodlí. Že? Máme oči, uši, nosy na to, aby jsme e, pochopili, kde jsme v bezpečí a e, kde jsme ohroženi. A víme, co máme dělat, kdy a kde, v jaké situaci v tom reálném světě. V okamžiku, kdy se dostaneme na síť, tak najednou ty naše city z toho reálného světa jsou omezeny. E, já, když jsem skutečně přemýšlel o tom, jestli stojím já osobně, armádě čínských hackerů za útok na můj mobilní telefon, nebo třeba korejský hackerů, nebo ruský hackerů, tak jsem dospěl k názoru, že spíš ne. A jako jedinec. Přemýšlel jsem o tom, jak, jak moc mám být kyberfobický, chcete-li. A přemýšlel jsem o tom, kdo vlastně stojí o naše data. A vypůjčil jsem si název jednoho známého filmu pro kategorizaci těch, kteří sbírají naše data. Uh, možná jste to viděli, že je to populární špagety vestem. The good, the bad and the ugly. V podstatě existují tři skupiny lidí, kteří u nás sbírají data, ať už tím, že my jim je dáváme, nebo nám je kradou a potom je nějakým způsobem zneužívají. Uh, jsou to, ti dobří jsou ti, kteří sbírají vaše data, nebo sbírají nějaká data a pro vás je to dobře. Uh, pak jsou ti, kdo sbírají vaše data a mění je za peníze. A pak jsou ti ošklivci, kteří sbírají vaše data, aby nad vámi měli kontrolu a aby vás ovládali. Jo? Když si to vezmete prakticky, je tady to kybernetické nebezpečí teprve dnes, když se před pár lety přijímal v tomto státě zákon o kybernetické bezpečnosti, skoro to vypadalo, že nebylo nic a teď najednou jsme všichni ohroženi kybernetickým útokem. A tak to není a zase pan Lukas píše ve své knize, jsme ohroženi kybernetickým útokem a jsme, jsme nebo máme se bát 
kybernetiky, tím více, čím víc naše životy závisí, ať už z pohodlnosti, nebo prostě je to důležitý pro nás biznis, že ty data prostě máme, sdílíme, dáváme je na síť. To znamená, ten problém se neobjevil ani včera, ani, ani dneska, ani se neobjevil skokově. On se objevil prostě tak, nebo tu příležitost jsme vystavili stejným tempem, jakým jsme začali využívat internet, respektive sdílení našich dat na síť. A ještě je tam jeden takový zvláštní posun. Kybernetika původně není Norbertem Wienerem definovaná jako něco, co se děje na internetu. Nepropadejme to je to této iluzi. Kybernetika je věda o výměně informací mezi organismy, společenství a stroji. Teprve potom jsme to dali na internet a došly nám termíny, tak jsme tomu říkali, začali říkat kybernetika. Komu teda vlastně dáváme ta svá data a jak bychom to měli dělat inteligentně? Buď to můžeme udělat takovým způsobem, aby jsme nebyli ohroženi, jak je tady popisováno, že skutečně dáme si ty počítače někam, kde to nikdo neví, ideálně ty je ještě dáme do baráku, který patří někomu jinému a tam tomu člověku to ani neřekneme, že jsme tam ty počítače dali. Vymyslíme si vlastní operační systém, programovací jazyk, ve kterém jsme to napsali, komunikační protokol, protokol na ukládání dat a pak se nám skutečně k té informaci v podstatě nikdo nedostane. Pokud vám to přijde úplně fantaskní, tak takovýmto způsobem se vyvíjejí zbraňové systémy. Složitý je, že takovýhle data se potom obtížně sdílí. Jiná věc je, že data sdílíme. Sdílíme je v soukromoprávních vztazích, sdílíme je ve veřejnoprávních vztazích. A neb sdílím, sdílíš, slídíme. Otázka je, jestli ty data, které takovýmto způsobem dáváme někomu, jsou skutečně používána jenom tak, jak je napsáno třeba v nějaké smlouvě s tím soukromoprávním subjektem, nebo jestli jsou opravdu používána pouze podle toho zákona, na základě kterého vlastně ta data, ta data e, jsou o nás sbírána nebo je rozdáváme. Za data peníze, no o čem si myslíte, že jsou všechny věrnostní programy? E, ti... Ještě abych tak řekl, čestní zlí to využívají jenom proto, aby získali oni další peníze od vás. Ti špatní zlí rovnou ty vaše data někomu třetímu prodají. No. Za data moc. No je, je pod záminkou boje proti profesionálním zločincům a ty si vždycky najdou jinou cestu. Stát sbírá data všechna. Dneska dopoledne poslanecká sněmovna schválila nový zákon o zdravotní péči. Báčný. Podívejte se na to, co všechno o nás budou sbírat. Jak chránit svá data? Mrčte. Moc toho o sobě říkáme. Vyplníme dotazník a vyplníme i to, co nemusíme. Co na síť nedáme, to se někdo dost těžko dozví. Těch lidí, kteří by byli vyhozený z práce za zvláštní fotografie na Facebooku a Twitteru a LinkedInu, těch už je hromada. E, vyberte si to nejsilnější zabezpečení, které je ještě pro vás pohodlné, pokud zabezpečujete svá data a je-li vám dána ta možnost. E, ne všechna vaše data je potřeba zabezpečit jako vstup do velínu jaderné elektrárny. Ale některá ano. Vybírejte si ty systémy, které umožňují různou míru zabezpečení, pokud někam vaše informace poskytujete. Problém je ovšem s legislativním hacknutím. To je věc, o které se až tak moc nehovoří. Každopádně stát, když chce nějaká data, tak to nedělá tak, že by hackoval systémy. On prostě změní legislativu. Řekne, tyhle data chci taky. Jo? E, abyste aby jsem vás ochránil před pár zločinci. Ilustrativní příloha. 
kdo je dobrý, kdo je špatný a kdo je ošklivý. Teď se objevila nová báječná databáze, která si myslím, že je dobrá. Česká potravinářská komora, uveřejní seznam potravin, včetně výrobců, včetně toho, z čeho ty potraviny jsou a budou to volně přístupná data. Já patřím mezi ty, který už na obalu potravin nic nepřečtou. Jo? A zcela nepochybně takováhle data umožní, abyste, aby někdo udělal nějakou aplikaci, která prostě bude hlídat, co jste si koupili, co jíte, hlídat vám, kolik jste do sebe dostali sacharidu, nebo pokud třeba nechcete nebo nemůžete přijímat nějaký léky. To je fajn, že takovýhle data budou. A že to bude dokonce povinný pro výrobce potravin, aby tam skutečně ta data dali. To znamená, vy budete moct vzít telefon, pustit si mobilní aplikaci, poskenujete si kód na těch sušenkách, že jo? na kterých jsou ty písmanka veliký půl milimetru a na telefonu se vám velkým, velkýma písmanama ukáže, co to je. To je fajn. Open government data. Báječný. Publikuje to stát. Pak už jsou ty špatný. Většina věrnostních systémů. Jo? Příklad je takovej, mé manželka si kupuje to kafe tady v Pařížský, v tom jednom obchodě, že jo? Se, a, a vždycky jim tam řekne, co si teda koupila, že jo? Já jsem tam jednou byl, má to jedinou praktickou výhodu, já jsem řekl, chci to, co si žena koupila minule, a oni mi tam takhle nabalili, jako je obrovský balí kafe, že jo? Já jsem nemusel přemýšlet. Uh, Nicméně jsem se zeptal jednou té prodavačky, tím se mi teda úplně vyvedl z míry, jestli ty data prodají životní pojišťovně. Jo, ona řekla, úplně to vyvedlo z míry. Jsem si říkal, no jo, ale možná, že jednou, až se půjdu pro životní pojištění, tak oni řeknou, pijete moc kafe. Jo. Registr bankovních účtů. To je úplně báčná ingerence do zcela soukromou právního vztahu. Co je u všech všude komu do toho, kde já mám svoje peníze? A báječný, bude centrální registr. Na pár zločinců, o vás o všech. Jo? Kde je zločinec? A tady se zaplať vám jeden, jeden dobrovolník ozval. Vy na to máte dokonce papír. Super. Jo? Ale i my všichni ostatní. Elektronická evidence tržeb, to je taky ingerence do jasně soukromoprávního vztahu. A já jsem ji dokonce napsal do dvou kolonek. A ona patří do kolonky The Bad i do kolonky The Ugly. Teda aspoň doufám, že patří jenom do kolonky The Bad. Aspoň autor té myšlenky nám říká, že nepatří do kolonky The Ugly. Ale já si spíš myslím, že patří do obou. Registr hrazených zdravotních výdajů, to je opravdu docela ošklivý, protože ve zdravotnických registrech Sice nejsou vypínače e, světel na ranvejích, ani e, výpustní kohouty e, z přehrad, ale jsou tam informace o slabých a špatných stránkách každého z nás. A tam se povede takhle pěkně informace jedna vedle druhého o tom, který úkon byl proplacen z zdravotního pojištění. Data jsou anonymizovaná. Když jsem se zeptal, proč je tam u toho záznamu rodní číslo, tak mi řekli, že aby se poznalo, jakého pohlaví je pacient a kolik je mu let. Málem jsem omdlel. K těm systémům, kde si můžete vybrat tu intenzitu té ochrany, patří například informační systém datových schránek, pokud to tušíte, tak fajn. Pokud to netušíte, tak jsem tady ukázal, jak vypadá přihlašovací, přihlašovací stránka do toho systému. Vy si můžete vybrat, jestli se přihlášíte jménem a heslem a obsáním toho obrázku, že, který mi se říká kapča, nebo jestli se přihlásíte certifikátem, nebo jestli si necháte potvrd, při, poslat potvrzovací sms nebo jestli se přihlásíte bezpečnostním kódem v rezidentní aplikaci vašeho mobilního telefonu. Já se jenom zeptám, nestejte se, kdo jste tenhle, tuhle tu webovou stránku ještě neviděl? Super, dobrý. Chce to taky čas. Asi polovina lidí to neviděla. To nevadí. Druhá polovina lidí to viděla. Nebo mě nerozuměla. Jo? 
jenom velice na závěr. Já nechci v žádném případě spochybňovat skutečně to, že existuje riziko toho, že útočí armáda hackerů nějakého státu na nějaký jiný stát. A když se na to podívám z toho svého osobního domácího pohledu, tak si dovolím vyslovit pár, pár rad. Poskytujte o sobě minimum dat. Předpokládajte, že vaše data čte neoprávněný uživatel. Vždycky to předpokládejte. Pro architekty informačních systémů mám jednu z vlastních zkušeností. Dáte-li dohromady databázy, mějte vždycky scénář B, co budete dělat, až vám ji někdo ukradne. A buďte si jistí, že čím méně si budete myslet, že je možné, že vám ji někdo ukradne, tím spíš vám ji někdo ukradne. A poslední. Hacker je daleko. Daleko nebezpečnější je oprávněný uživatel, který se dívá na vaše data. To je daleko slabší perimetr, než jsou firewally a e, různá jiná zabezpečení. To je oprávněný uživatel. Bere 15 tisíc hrubýho a smí se koukat na vaše data. E, děkuji. So, the clear response to, to my clear question. Uh, Tomáš, in the world of the, which is full of the crooks uh, and a lot of naivete among uh, the Westerners, you know, everybody shares the same values. What our Western world, what our country should do Uh, to fix uh, the problem. What is the right pill? Uh, Alej has uh, proposed the right pill for the relationship between the citizen and the system. What is the right pill for the state and the crooks? Well, thank you. I will give... Uh, Three recent examples from the last month, which I have encountered here in the Czech Republic. One of them is not related directly to Czech Republic, but indirectly, yes. Uh, I had a private conversation with a high-ranking member of the Czech uh, establishment uh, on the margins of one conference. Uh, and I will not mention, of course, the name because it was a private conversation, and I don't want to make it political. I don't want to politicize this debate. Uh, and I was saying, okay, now you are gathering so much data, and you are planning to gather even more data. Uh, how much you are going to be investing, and what will you do in protecting the data? And it was, a, by the way, conference which was related to security, and to, to partly cybersecurity and to security. And the answer was, no, no, we are gathering just some numbers. And they are completely independent, and it's, uh, uh, no one can misuse it. I was saying, okay, you are gathering independent numbers, but you are gathering them to get them together at a certain moment. Uh, and this is the reason why you are gathering that, because you want to use it as a government uh, for something. So this is the place where the those who want to steal the data go. They don't go to the users who are sending the data, all the data into it, because it is, really doesn't make sense. Uh, so, and you would have to have a huge system and huge algorithm to do it. Uh, it's also possible, but it's uh, very expensive and, uh, and, and basically very complicated. So you want to steal the final product, which is done and gathered and already analyzed, and this is where you, uh, where you want to go. The answer was, no, 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 it's, uh, it's completely naive, it's, it's completely safe. And this is really worrying, because nothing is completely safe, and this is exactly how it works, and this is exactly where the weakness is. And I agree with Alesh that the weakness is more with the people operating it and inside the system than the outsiders. Either those in the system could be misused, uh, so could be paid, uh, uh, could be just their stupidity, anger, uh, whatever reasons, at the end you can get a hole into the system directly and if you use 
sophisticated techniques, then uh, it's much uh, easier. The other example was that one of the big infrastructural or parts of the Czech critical infrastructure, very good company, company by the way which has invested into the IT systems in the past, uh, uh, was saying no, we have no problem, we have invested, we are 100% safe and uh, uh, don't worry, uh, uh, we are fine. Uh, they did go through a test uh, and of course their system failed in three minutes. One of the reasons in the first testing of the system and the failure in the simulation, which was the real simulation, was that all the data about the whole system of the state infrastructural company was on the internet because the dissertation work was done on three cases and it was made public and, uh, and easily accessed. So those who were testing, they gathered all the relevant information from open sources. They did have the system and they knew exactly how it operates, so it was very easy to, uh, uh, to get into the system or to show them how to get into the system. And how it's, so it's a good example that someone at least was saying that they are great and they know how to handle everything, but at least they tested themselves and, and they saw that no one is uh, protected uh, and sometimes you are not protected at all. And the third example is from a, an American company which uh, has its base in Israel, it used to be an Israeli company, now it's a global company specializing on security, uh, including on the cyber. It's still the laboratory is in Israel, and uh, they do test the cyber environments of uh, state uh, institutions, uh, of uh, big companies, corporations, etc. And of course, if they test something, if they put their device uh, into the system, they always find something, because always you do find something. Uh, so the question is how dangerous it is and what to do with that, but you, it's guaranteed that you always find something. Uh, and they did do tests, and they were showing me the tests of one institution from Western Europe, the state institution from Western Europe. I do not know. I know the country, I do not know exactly what was the institution, and one critical infrastructure company from Western Europe also, which I don't know even from which country. And through a test of three days, they did show me what everything they have found, what everything was there sitting in the system for 10 years and was not activated. And of course, once we are talking about Russia, and this is my link to Russia, of course in Many parts you had some links to Russia. It doesn't mean that in everything it originated in Russia. Sometimes it's done through other countries. That's how it works. Uh, it's, it's not a, this was not a proof what I did see that it would be uh, f some directly Russian activity f or activity of the Russian state, etc. But you did see very serious breaches and malware and the holes in the system which were implemented into the system, some of them a long time ago, and were waiting to be activated by somehow in the future, and no, matter, no, no one, and they didn't tell me what was their final findings and, uh, and what was the activation of what did they find uh, exactly what they think the purpose was. Uh, what to do is I hope that every serious Czech institution should test its own system by some of these devices and should find out uh, what is happening and then act accordingly. Uh, so always knowing that you are never completely secure, always knowing that you can improve things and it's possible, uh, but you have to of course decide what is critical and what is less critical because 100% uh, security doesn't exist, uh, even if you invest uh, a lot of money, uh, uh, and it's very costly, and it's never guaranteed that it's 100% security, so you have to be deciding what is uh, exactly uh, uh, your goal and what is the critical parts of the system you have to be, you have to be protecting. Uh, going to Russia, uh, of course it's a very hazy system, uh, because you have... Uh, known, published uh, f uh, attacks directly done by the government and governmental institutions. Uh, f by the way, sometimes they are not hiding it. Uh, f you have very many examples of uh, 
hacking activities or the, the, or the cyber activities and information activities done by activists. And sometimes they are independent activists, uh, as in every country. Sometimes they are just useful idiots, as in every country. And sometimes they are directly, uh, uh, basically paid and, uh, and guided by the government institutions. Some of them also spoke openly uh, so that it has been going on. And it's, again, no secret. There are even some addresses of those places where people were paid for the hacking by the state institutions uh, next to or as part of St. Petersburg, for example. Uh, Russia is not hiding their activities. They are hiding the particular activities, but they are not hiding that they, are, they have their cyber command. We don't. Uh, there are some Western countries uh, which do have already cyber commands. Uh, they do not hide that in the Russian doctrine, the cyber war is also information war. This is a distinction between our Western doctrines, what it means cyber war exactly, and the distinction what is the uh, cyber war in the mindset of uh, the Soviet school. By the way, still also used in the Baltic states, this terminology or this, uh, this, um, uh, this scope of the cyber warfare. In Russian, informationaya uh, barba, it's part of the cyber warfare and it's, uh, it's, you cannot basically separate it. Again, this is in the public documents. This is not any secret. This is how the system, how the system works. So Russia invests into the system. They invest into the hardware, software, into their skills. They invest into the people. They have people in the intelligence. They have people in the army. They have people who are fighting the cyber wars. Because again, in their doctrine, and rightfully so, the cyber war, that's why they have the cyber command, is genuine and inseparable part of any war, which is being fought now, and which will be fought in the future. Uh, that's why you have the land command, air command, naval command, and the cyber command. Because at the end, you cannot separate it, not now and in the future, but you cannot separate it already, uh, already uh, uh, for several years at least. By the way, cyber command has Iran. The cyber units has regime of Bashar Assad. It's not the, only the big five permanent members of the, uh, of, the National, of the Security Council of UN. It's not only the big countries. It's the countries which are taking their security seriously. And I'm not saying it positively, negatively. They do know that it is inherited, integrated part. And without that, and without the cyber and the information war, you cannot or you fight the wars or you are much more, if you don't have it, you are much more vulnerable to uh, lose. And uh, again, if you look into the open wars where Russia has been involved in the last decade, of, uh, some of them hybrid wars, then you had the use of uh, cyber wars sometimes in the front line in Estonia. Uh, it was much more cyber information war than the real war. It was not a real war years ago, a decade ago. Uh, in Georgia, during the conflict, the whole internet of, the Georg of Georgia was rerouted twice into Russia. The whole internet traffic of the country. Uh, it was returned once, then, uh, then to Germany, then again back, and, uh, and that. And it was inherited part, and it was, not, it was planned in advance because this is part of the strategy of fighting the wars. Uh, so, and then you can look at Ukraine. And there you have uh, the whole range of... Uh, Propaganda uh, or informazione a barba in that sense. You have the espionage part, and you have the attacks on the critical infrastructure. Uh, most recently on the on the electric grid, but you have it on the naftohas uh, of, uh, on the on, of the oil and gas system. Uh, and again, it was never claimed officially, but uh, it's very natural, and it's also part of the written doctrine. So we should understand that this is uh, the wars of today and the wars of the future. Uh, I don't know what it will be in 50 and 100 years, but definitely in the, in the near future. And we should get prepared ourselves. Uh, the serious countries of 
NATO or EU uh, take it seriously and they do develop their skills, they do invest into it, they do invest into the people and they see that it's uh, good for defense and offense and they also know that you cannot separate defense and offense once you are fighting war or once you, you have to be defending yourself. This is something which we cannot say anything here in Europe that uh, there, is, there are some kind of offensive skills, everything is defense, and sometimes we are saying it's active defense, meaning that once something happens there can be some offense, but at the end we must also, we must understand and admit that once you want to win the war, or you don't want to be destroyed, uh, no matter who starts the war, then you have to uh, really go into the cyber and into the defensive and offensive uh, activities of cyber, and planning for such wars, which may, may not happen at the end, and who is prepared for the war then doesn't have to fight the war at the end sometimes, uh, then it's also planning it now, looking into the future what may be with your skills and activities, and be prepared uh, regarding your friends, enemies, uh, foes, uh, whoever is there on the on the basis. So what to do again? It's uh, invest into the people, invest into the systems, uh, be Acknowledge that you are vulnerable and you cannot be 100% protected. Uh, if, uh, don't say that, uh, yes, uh, no one will steal this data, what was here uh, from, from the because it can be stolen. Uh, if, uh, and uh, if, uh, definitely someone will try to steal it. How serious it will be, how fast it will be, how easy it will be, uh, hard to say. How it will be misused, if it's going to be activists, if it's going to be the governments, uh, if uh, the governments, it's, if some other governments collect it also and use it or never use it, again, it's the, this is the question. But we must admit that this is going to be happening uh, because this is the age we are living in. And uh, Russia is not the only example of the country doing that. Uh, if, uh, uh, it's one of the examples of the countries doing that. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, it's uh, one of the real clear examples of a uh, country using uh, uh, a cyber war and cyber information war as part of the national doctrine uh, and as part of uh, fighting for their interests as they do define it themselves. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much uh, to everybody. I, I think uh, I would open a uh, debate and Q&A uh, uh, part, otázky, odpovědi, so prepare your question. Before doing that, I think it's uh, appropriate to give the floor again to, uh, to Edward Lucas. Uh, I have noticed there are two elementary responses here, how to tackle the problem. One uh, by Aleš Kučera, which I would call less is more. <laughs> so uh, don't give up too much and then we will not be so vulnerable. Uh, the other advice, uh, the best defense is the offense <laughs> by uh, Tomáš Pojar. And I would say that they are somehow complementary and that we should follow the both passes and uh, select this accordingly. But uh, what is your view uh, about, about their pills? Uh, Ed, I think you should sell a few words. I think that the first point to make is that everybody is vulnerable. The idea that the hackers and other malefactors are interested in only in people who've got money or only in people who've got lots of data, this is not true. Yeah. If you own a computer, then someone would like to have it on a botnet to enslave it and use it to send out spam. Just the fact you have a computer makes you <coughs> vulnerable. If you have an ID, uh, have, an, have an email address, then that is useful to an attacker because once an attacker gets into your email, he can then send out emails to all your friends and try and trick them into sending him money. So there is, there is I, I think you, 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 you have to start off from the basis that everybody is, is vulnerable. Whatever you do on the internet, no matter how little, there's someone out there who maybe in an automated way, not in a targeted way, will be trying to steal your um, identity and get hold of your machine and, and maybe also steal your data. I think on the, um, the what to do, one of the useful ways of thinking about this is we have to think much more 
in the way that intelligence and counterintelligence officers do. If you work in the world of counterintelligence, counterespionage, you assume that you're being attacked all the time. Well, that's right, you are being attacked all the time on the internet. And then you have defense in depth. You assume that once they get in, um, that you will try and spot them. So you have honeypots and honey nets. Um, the Georgians did this brilliantly when they put a document on their um, defense ministry server, which was called something like secret NATO war plans. And they knew the Russians would get in sooner or later, and they did, and the Russians stole this document and took it back. What they didn't realize was the document had some very ingenious malware on it, provided by a large, friendly country, which um, then infected the Russian, the GRU computer. So the result was the Georgians could actually see from the webcam and listen on the microphone and watch the Russians as they were um, uh, discussing what to do with this document. But once you assume that there's an enemy on your network, then you can start planning how to um, spot him, how to distract him, um, maybe how to, how to trick him. And I think the third point is that this is fundamentally not a technical problem. We have the technical means to be safe now. It's just we are too lazy and careless to do it. The biggest weakness on any computer network is what in the jargon they call the carbon-based interface. That's you and me. Um, and you, you have to, if you're going to take, the, the technical solutions are fine, but you have to do them in combination with human solutions. The, the biggest weakness is what they call social engineering, tricking people into giving things away. And so you have to have a joined up response where you integrate your physical security, which is doors and windows and who gets into the building, the design of, the choice of what computers and networks you have and what hardware and software you have, the choice of what data you put on them, and absolutely right, not everything has to be on the internet, but also the way in which you deal with the people, whether it's your employees, your customers, your suppliers, um, uh, and anyone else who has dealing with you. What permissions do they have? How long are those permissions for? What can they do? How do you revoke those permissions if they're abused? How do you track what people are doing? Um, and if you put all that together, then I think you can quite easily not make yourself completely secure, because if the NSA or the Chinese or the British really determine to get in, they will. But most of the time on the internet, you, are, you just have to be the least attractive house in the road from the robber's point of view. Once they see you're very well defended, they'll go and bother someone else. I would just add uh, to the sentence that everybody is vulnerable. It means also including all the enemies. It's, uh, they are also vulnerable, be it the states, be it the activists, be it the thieves. So we should know it, we should take it seriously, and they should know that if they don't do something, it will not be without a cost. Yeah, and if, it's not, if they know that it's gonna not, not going to be, it's going to be with some cost, you are much more protected uh, and you can feel much more secure. Uh, I just didn't want to, to uh, express myself the way that there are people who are not vulnerable and the others are more or, or, or less and exactly as Ed said, you know, it, it might be of course, you know, an automated attack and uh, many of you might have experienced that all of a sudden your notebook uh, becomes, you know, too busy despite of the fact you're doing anything and uh, at, at that particular time it might have been that, that, that your uh, computer is actually being just sold on a, on a dark internet, you know, on a, on a black market as a part of a botnet structure and currently your, uh, your notebook actually is a part of uh, the joint computing power which is running distributed DOS attack against, you know, system XYZ in the country ABC. That's possible. The question is, what is your responsibility then if you're just a household person who just using a computer, just browsing the internet, you know, for a good receipt for a cake? Uh, what I believe is important to understand, and it was emphasized by Edward as well, everybody should, I mean, responsible people for the uh, cybersecurity should balance 
the investment on various perimeters of defense, whether it's personal, uh, personal security perimeter, object security perimeter, uh, cryptography, other ways of securing, securing the data. Uh, the other aspect is that uh, recently we see that many organizations, including whether, whether they're private or, or, or states, tend to centralize the data uh, and uh, their argument is we have to centralize the data to understand, uh, to understand uh, or to perform our job, uh, whatever it is. We have to centralize the data. And I believe this is not exactly true. Once the data being centralized, it's a single point of failure. It's a target for any attacker. Uh, I would just uh, recall another book of an author, which I just uh, you know looked at Wikipedia. Uh, not so important the name of it, Ori Bremen. He wrote a book, The Starfish and the Spider. If you have a chance to read it, and the subtitle is actually the unbeatable power of a distributed organization. Once we have the data distributed, it is difficult actually to, to target the attack on a single point of failure. And there's also a, almost a philosophical question where actually the data becomes an information. Don't mix it. The data does not equal information, which is also in, in, in Ed's book. A list of people, people's names, uh, means actually nothing unless you know their uh, a secret agents, for instance. Then it becomes an information. Before it's just the data. So I would say, yeah, we have to defend. We have to attack. But we have to think about the secure design of our data structure. Does it have to be centralized? Does it have to be centralized all of us? Does it have to be centralized permanently or not? Because while it's not centralized, it's much easier, it's much more difficult to understand the data and transform the data into information. Actually, having a data means nothing. I'm not so worried about electronic uh, revenue evidence. It's huge exabytes of data which is very difficult to understand. Okay, thank you very much. And the floor is now open for your questions, remarks. So Eva has a microphone and I am just looking for uh, your hands. So please don't hesitate to who is the first. It's always the problem who is gonna to be the first. Somebody must be the first. <laughs> yeah, please introduce yourself. And... Thank you very kindly, Charles Ross, European Anti Corruption Center. I'd like to thank Mr. Lucas and our distinguished panelists for the fascinating presentation. Indeed, we have known about the strategic threat from Russia and the abuse of infrastructure towards data for many, many years. I think, as all of our panelists know, and many people in this room, the Yeltsin Strategic Doctrine in Section 2 clearly outlined the penetration of Western banking and information structures. Coming from Intelsat, I recognize that we have been talking about these problems for many, many years offline. And the question then comes back, basically, to what Ambassador Poyar was suggesting, that, in fact, an active defense as a deterrence is indeed the structure we need to approach, I believe. I would really appreciate, in light of what we've seen in the Donbass in recent weeks, where the unofficial Russian forces have introduced massive amounts of electronic warfare fighting equipment uh, right up to the contact line. I would appreciate your gentleman's thoughts on how should we address these problems going forward. Thank you. 
Well, that's a great question. Um, I think you're right that the foundation of defence is deterrence, and we've been very bad at that. There's a great deal we could do. Um, people talk a lot about sanctions. I think, actually, the first thing you can do is just enforce your existing laws strictly. And this is something that we have failed to do with Russia over the period of 25 years by allowing them to run riot in the international financial system. There have been a few points of contact, such as the investigation of the Bank of New York for money laundering back in the late 90s. But there's a great deal of what one might politely call monkey business has gone on, which hasn't been policed. And we should be going after those transactions and we should be going after the bankers and lawyers and accountants who facilitated those transactions and say, we're going to prosecute you now. You're going to go to jail for a long time, maybe in America. And um, you, you, the alternative is you tell us what you've been up to. That would be a very serious deterrent. Visa policy is another serious deterrent. We've put some top Russians on the visa blacklist. We could do more. We could do 10,000 top Russians, and not just them, their spouses, their siblings, their offspring, and their parents. And that would be a really big deterrent for some official who comes back after a day's pillaging in eastern Ukraine and finds his daughter is furious because she can't go to complete her university course, his mother is furious because she can't go and have her teeth done in Switzerland, his wife is furious because she can't go and... Um, go shopping in London. I'm using some gender stereotyping here. It could all be the other way around. Um, but um, hey, there's a lot more we could do, and we don't do it. Um, but we are, you know, we are 40... If you put the West, as in the EU and NATO, together, we are 800 million people and a $40 trillion GDP. Russia is 140 million people and a $1.6 trillion GDP and shrinking. It's astonishing that they're able to push us around. And they do that not because they're strong, but because they're strong-willed. They're willing to take risks, use force, lie about what they do. And we're not. Um, and as Clausewitz said, if you have two adversaries, one with strong means and weak will, and the other with strong will and weak means, the one with the strong will wins. And that's why Russia's doing well. There's plenty we could do. We just don't want to do it. Well... You can ask also in the Czech language. We have the translation, so and not, it's not a problem. So if you, if you, well, I see. Uh, my question is maybe. Jo, že se můžete zeptat i česky, jako jo, tady, I že to mám říct česky, ale okay, go on. My question is maybe a bit far from the topic, but maybe not. What about uh, the internet voting or e-voting? Uh, as far as I know, the only country, especially in Europe, with full electronic voting is Estonia. And also, as far as I know, there haven't been any serious attack. And also, Estonia is one of the Baltic countries, and Russian threat is obvious. So are they so good? Or we should expect something from Russia in question of this. So I, I think your question was about electronic voting in Estonia, whether it's... Well, really and Russian threat. Elections in Estonia, yeah. they are vulnerable? Well, I, I think, the, the, I mean, Estonia is under constant attack with the result they take it really seriously. And so they have built into their system the assumption that they're going to be attacked and then ways of, of dealing with it. So the, the main attack they had in 2007 was this very crude... Um, distributed denial of service, DDoS attack, which is basically like a, just a vast electronic mob. And they've now built in um, to their, all their important servers mirror sites and filters and other ways so the DDoS attacks basically don't, don't work anymore. They're also very worried about Russia um, trying to corrupt the data on their system. And so they now back up the whole country. It's backed up to the cloud. It's backed up to data embassies, in, which are servers in um, Estonian embassies in other countries. And they do that on a very regular basis. So even if someone got in and tried to wipe the land registry or rewrite something in the banking system, they can go back to a last known good um, pretty, pretty confidently, and they're trialing that. They're also very interested in the blockchain. 
um, the distributed ledger um, technology, which the blockchain enables, and they see that as a way of building in more resilience. So I think, I mean, I would rather be in a country that's constantly being attacked and knows how to look after itself than a country that thinks that there's no threat. Yeah, there is a hero. <laughs> uh, I, I want to speak Czech because my English is not wherever I want. Yes. Um, uh, já mám takovou poznámku k tématu. Uh, stala se mi poprvé v životě věc. Stáhn, koupil jsem si od tom tomu navigaci, aby se aktivovala, si musím stáhnout jejich aplikaci. Tady si musím vytvořit účet, nějaký jméno, příjmení a heslo. A uh, poprvé v životě se mi stalo, že jsem napsal heslo příliš dlouhé. Napsal jsem heslo, který jsem vymyslel a aplikace mi řekla, že mám heslo moc dlouhý a že si mám heslo zkrátit prostě mezi 6 až 12 znaky, což mě trošku vyděsilo, protože všude jako mi tvrdě má mít hesla prostě dlouhý, neopakovat písmena, čísla, velký, malý písmena a tak dále. A e, ještě jedna poznámka k, k ruský hrozbě a, a e, k Rusku a Estonsku. Já jsem přesvědčený, že Putin nám ukazuje, že i v 21. století se dá dělat realpolitik a využívá tomu prostě ty prostředky, který má, to znamená využívá tomu i ty kybernetické útoky a je to prostě pokračování jeho politiky jinými prostředky, abych ta trochu parafrázoval Klausovicou v definici války. Tak, děkuji. Well, in response to your first question, I think passwords are basically stupid. And any security system that's based on a password um, is, in my mind, already flawed. I don't think that's the way the combination of passwords and logins is fundamentally insecure, um, not least because it means someone is storing the password at the other end and probably storing it very badly. Um, yes, you're right. I think Putin sees, and, and it's not just Putin. I think our problems with Russia predate Putin and will continue after Putin. But the Russian approach is that international politics is fundamentally about conflict. As they would say in Russian, kto kavo, who does what to whom, that's what it's all about. And they just don't believe that we are sincere with our talk about a rules-based order, international law, human rights and so on. They think that's just baloney which is used to cover up um, a system which is fundamentally based, about, based on power and greed like theirs is. And so they proceed on that basis that conflict is essential, it's always happening, it's perpetual, and it just shifts. And sometimes the conflict is, and competition is economic, sometimes it's economic with espionage and diplomacy and coercion and other things thrown in. Sometimes it goes into um, undeclared military conflict, sometimes it goes into declared military conflict. But they, they don't see a binary divide between war and non-war. They think it's just a question of what the, what, what's the weather today, but it's all fundamentally about this ruthless competition in which they are determined not to lose. Well, another hero? Ah, it's gonna better. The first one and then it's the other one. Uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, misuse, uh, misuse of information is, uh, uh, is, a, ge is a worldwide general problem. Uh, for instance, uh, 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 the government of the USA uh, um, monitored, um, uh, monitored uh, conversation, telephone, telephone conversation, uh, of uh, 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 of uh, uh, you mean the NSA prime ministers uh, uh, prime minister of the western uh, of uh, yes of the um, western western european states uh, uh, for instance uh, for instance uh, uh, you know including uh, angela angela merkel quite right uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, even uh, the, uh, the new uh, uh, computer system, Windows 10, uh, if, you inst if, if you use Windows 10, 
in such a in such a case, uh, uh, the <coughs> uh, Microsoft will know all all data or can collect all all, all data uh, which you uh, uh, which you have in your computer. You know? I'm sorry, sir. Do, do you mind if I give you a very blunt answer? Um, if you have an, an agency, which is a foreign intelligence agency, there is a clue in the name about what it does. The, the job of a foreign intelligence agency is to gather intelligence on foreign countries. And this is true in America, it's true in France, it's true in Britain, and it's true in Germany. And I don't see any moral high ground here. I think it's entirely right that the... Um, America's NSA knew what Merkel's mobile phone number was and I would be shocked if I was the American president and I was going into negotiations with Angela Merkel, I'd want to know what she'd been saying on the phone and no doubt her Bundesnachrichtendienst and the Kommando Strategischer Aufklärung, which is the German equivalent of NSA would be doing exactly the same and this is why if you are an American government official and you are going to Paris you leave your government-issued BlackBerry on the plane in a lead box because the French security service is extremely good at getting inside devices as soon as they cross the French frontier. This is why the um, French consul in Texas not so long ago was expelled from the United States at 48 hours' notice because he was not, in fact, a consul. He was a member of the French intelligence service. Now, if you want to move to a world where we have unilater unilateral intelligence disarmament, which seems to be what Mr. Snowden wants, and just get rid of intelligence and security agencies, well, fine, set up a, polit a political party and see if anybody will vote for you. But in the meantime, I think most people in most countries think that just as their countries need police forces and need armies and navies and air forces, they need spy agencies, and those spy agencies will do exactly what they're supposed to, which is spying. And that is not going to change. Well, by the way, the French, after the Paris attacks, what they do, the first thing, was to call US and to get them as much information as possible on all the attackers and the other people, because once something like that happens, you go and ask and try to find those people. And, of course, one of the phone calls is to US. If something... God forbid, would happen in Prague, we would be calling U.S. and trying to ask them for whatever information they have on the phone calls, credit cards, uh, uh, for computers, etc., to get the people, not those who blew themselves up, uh, but who helped them, who guided them in, is, uh, uh, who paid them, etc. So this is, the question is not the gathering of information, uh, the question is what you do with the information and the question is also what you offer as a state uh, to the others, what, what, uh, what you offer as a person and as a state to the others to gather the information from you. Uh, and this, is, this should be the debate. Uh, so the, the debate is to not to misuse the information and also to know that every country does this and uh, we should watch more the enemies, what they do, and not the friends, because then we are going to be asking the friends to help us. And if we can help our friends, fine. I, I would be glad if someone called Czech Republic and wanted some information if someone is really trying to get some criminal. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes we send the criminal not to the right person, <laughs> to, the, to the right place. <laughs> And this is exactly the comment, you know, if you don't like it, just don't use the phone, you know, to, to, to communicate the information which you, which you don't want to get into the other's hands. Because, you know, the telephone has been a private communication tool just about three months after the invention. Yeah, and then, then it was over. Because then, then, of course, you know, somebody came to the idea well, how about it has some value for me if I listen to the other people's conversation? And the same with letters and the same with emails and the same with other means of communication. And I'd also just, I would also point out that America is the only country in the world which offers any sort of legal protection for foreigners in terms of what the intelligence service does. If you look at PPD, um, 28, the presidential um, directive, it actually lays out specifically the grounds on which, the legal grounds on which you can spy on foreigners. 
That is not something you will find in any other country in the world. I loved that response. So, uh, Dan Kummerman, and then there is a hand. So, maybe uh, Dan, or here is one, and then the other one on the left. Well, I have just far brief, left. Brief comments, and since you mentioned it here, the terrorist attacks and so on, isn't it actually the problem that after every single terrorist attack? you find out that the information was there on the net, somewhere, hanging somewhere in, in the air, and we just didn't reach it. So actually, it's, it's the fact is that there's too much information to really get the proper message. Well, I, I think that's not, I mean, the, there's actually an awful lot of terrorist attacks which don't happen because we did get the information. So you, you've got to start off from a, you know, making your deductions from the right collection of events. Um, I don't think that electronic intelligence collection is a perfect solution. It's always going to be imperfect, and terrorists, not least thanks to Edward Snowden, are getting much better at covering up their tracks. And we have some things like encryption, which are basically good for all of society, and I'm in favour of strong encryption, but they do present unique new challenges um, to intelligence and security services. Um, yes, we need to be better at joining the dots, and we're getting better at joining the dots, but I think you have to start off... I, I, I don't understand the hypothesis that intelligence and security services ought to be perfect. I assume that they're just as um, incompetent as all other government bureaucracies, and I'm surprised when they get something right rather than being horrified when they get something wrong. Uh, yeah, I would, uh, I would uh, strengthen this message... More terrorist attacks were prevented or didn't happen than happened in France, in Germany, in UK, in US, etc. Partly because of the electronic surveillance, partly because of human intelligence. If you just rely on the electronics, it's never enough. Uh, uh, human intelligence is very, very important. Uh, at the end, we go to the weakness or the strengths or weaknesses of the human beings. Uh, uh, and uh, you were ambassador in Israel, as I was ambassador in Israel. In Israel, once you enter Israel, all communication is monitored and filtered. Of course, it depends on, and everyone knows that. It's not a, it's not a secret. It, it depends on the algorithm, on how it's evaluated, etc. But I'm sure that if you send SMS or Viber or whatever message after you land uh, and send, okay, let's kill Bibi Netanyahu, Someone will immediately monitor that. Uh, so, of course, it goes to Arabic, it goes to other mutations, languages, etc. But this is happening. The, and the system there, despite all the attack, it's working. It's preventing many more attacks not happening or not happening in a scale as is wished than really happening at the end. Uh, so the successful attacks are those which are really done without any electronic communication. Uh, so, but then their magnitude is usually lower because then you go with a knife uh, and, uh, and it's not uh, so impressive. Uh, you kill one person or two, but you don't... Uh, you don't uh, so it's, it is, uh, it's a liberal democracy with a lot of surveillance of everyone, uh, but the surveillance is not misused. And this is the key point, how not to misuse the communication. And sometimes you prevent the attacks... Uh, and sometimes you don't prevent it, but at least because of the gathering of information, you can prevent some other attacks because you can identify the people in the ring and who has helped and who has been around. It's, it's, it's complicated. There is a lot of democratic dilemmas in this issue, uh, and it should be always questioned how far to go and how much freedom to give for security. Uh, so it's not easy, but uh, it's very natural, and we will be, and we are going in the same direction. Uh, you have... There, use, there were almost no cameras on the streets. You have cameras everywhere. And it will be more and more cameras, more and more uh, electronic monitoring of everything, of every step of every one of us in the future, because this is the tendency, this is the trend where the, where the world goes. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my question is, I think, very easy for you. Uh, what do you think about misleading information on the social networks? Because of on the daily basis, what we can see, that's something I can call cyberphobia. Because of uh, we can see pictures, articles, videos that they are totally misleading, full of not trustworthy information, 
but still people can buy, see it, and they think that uh, it's something based on real situation, and then that's what I think I, we can call the cyberphobia. Well, you're, you're entirely right, and this is something which people are only beginning to wake up to. Uh, I've been complaining for 20 years about Russian propaganda, and when social media started, I saw that it was something the Russians were going to use. They actually started off with the comment fields um, in mainstream media organizations where in the business model sometimes reckons an article is successful if it gets a lot of comments and you could see these Kremlin trolls um, who are placing comments being paid 50 cents a time or whatever it was they, they got. And I'm glad to say that some papers are now saying no we don't do this anymore. We only have we have verified comments and to be a verified commenter you have to be a subscriber, you have to give some kind of real world ID you can't just invent something um, so I think there may be an evolution happening where you start only taking things seriously on Twitter if they come from verified accounts so that you know, news outlets will be um, cutting down on these comment fields but it's a real problem and it comes at a, it, it comes at a time when the, the the media that I work for, the old mainstream media, is finding life very tough. Um, you know, our business model is broken. We don't have a new one. We can't make money from advertising on the internet, and people don't want to pay for news. And nobody buys print editions anymore, so what do we do? And meanwhile, there's all this kind of bogus stuff out there like Sputnik and Bought News and um, RT, subsidized by the Russian government, um, which looks like news. It's quite entertaining to read. It sometimes has some quite interesting stories. And it's full of poison. And we don't have an answer to that. I, um, I, I think we, we are, I commend to you very strongly, if you haven't seen it already, the website stopfake.org, which is a Ukrainian site in English and in Russian, which looks at Russian disinformation and exposes it. I, hope, I think in the long run, the answer is that you, the consumer of news, have to be more discriminating. You have to be more choosy. And just as you wouldn't eat really bad junk food from a fast food stall in the middle of the night because you reckon it might give you a stomach upset, you wouldn't eat the information equivalent of really bad fast food because you might upset your brain. Well, the positive news is that sometimes those who spread the disinformation fall into the trap of disinformation and they start to believe it themselves. Uh, and I think that we have two very recent good examples. One is the Eastern Ukraine. Uh, the m massive disinformation campaign prior, and, and I'm not talking about Crimea, Crimea partly, but the Eastern Ukraine, Crimea is a special, sorry. The, Eastern, the massive social media disinformation campaigns long run, really Kremlin started to believe that most of the people in Eastern Ukraine are waiting for this uprising and those re the, the self-determination or uh, linked to Russia. The reality was completely opposite. By the way, everyone was surprised by that. Because most of the people did not want it. And the result, or let's say the result of the war as we see it now, is a failure of expectations of how much territory you can grab with those, uh, those uh, semi-autonomous regimes. The part of Donbass, which is under the Russian control, is a very tiny part of what was thought that it would be partly because of the trap. Here, we did see it also. The, before this uh, US convoy of few vehicles going through Czech Republic, uh, to, from Germany through Czech Republic to Poland and then back, uh, looking into the social media, you would expect that there would be demonstrations against it and hardly someone will come to greet uh, them. Uh, those who were spreading that, they believed that themselves. At the end, the, the result was the opposite. Uh, so I'm not saying that this is, not, this is always happening. Uh, the, it's serious. It is, we should take it really seriously. But sometimes <coughs> those who spread the disinformation fall into this trap of the virtual reality uh, that uh, you think that those comments under the whatever articles and interviews are the comments of majority. And at the end, it's not even the majority, it's not the majority from here, but a lot of people are going into that from outside, so it's not even only about the citizens of that particular constituency or, or, or place. Well, 
I think I don't see any. Oh, the last question. Okay, the last one. Hello. Jakub Thomas, I work at the Prague Security Studies Institute. Uh, I'm curious, what, in your opinion, Mr. Lucas, what should we do about messaging applications such as Telegram that is, allows you to send encrypted messages and is very popular in countries such as Iran or among the foreign fighters in Syria? Thank you. Um, the question is about these, this end-to-end -end encryption where it's mathematically impossible to break the encryption and therefore offers very secure um, messaging for people who may be doing it for good reasons but may also be doing it for bad reasons. I would say be very careful in thinking that it's actually secure because although the math, it may be secure while it's in the encrypted tunnel, it is composed on a machine which is hackable and it will be received on a machine that is hackable. And my own country is GCHQ, the NSA, the French, the Germans, the Russians, the Chinese are all really, really good at getting into these machines. And they can get in in a way that they can read what's on the screen, they can listen to what's said on the, on the microphone, they can see what's being typed in on the keyboard. Um, these are full of vulnerabilities, these machines. It doesn't matter how good your encryption is. Once they've targeted you, once they think, you know, we're interested in, you know, this chap, you know, Honza Novak, whatever his name is, we want his, they will get onto your machine and they will know everything that happens on it. What encryption allows you to do is to communicate um, in a way that doesn't come onto their radar in the first place. So if you're buying disposable phones and disposable SIM cards for cash, you may be able to communicate by telegram and they won't see that. And, 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 you, and, and until they've got you in their sights, until they have targeted you, then you may be able to communicate securely. But of course you don't know that they've targeted you. So I, I'm very cautious. I think this gives you a false sense of security. And I, um, I think the, I'm, I'm thoroughly against forcing companies like Telegram to put back doors into their encryption because that will then be used by, inevitably they will leak and they'll be used by um, criminals and, and other people. So I believe in secure encryption. It's the fun, fundamental basis for doing any kind of e-banking or commerce over the internet using a credit card. We need encryption to be really good. But in terms of the security of the message, um, the problem is at the ends of the tunnel, not in the middle. Okay. Radio and then we have some dinner. So it's my time just <laughs> of a word of thank you. Uh, Ed, uh, what is the English word for those uh, quotations? Bl 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 there is a blurb, you know, it's the English and American people, they call those quotation of uh, the distinguished author. You know, if you publish the book, you have to ask some others to. Uh, offer some words of appreciation, so it's a blurb, if, if you... So there, uh, at the end of Cyberphobia, the, there is a blurb by Michael Chertoff, the former U.S. Secretary of Homeland uh, Affairs, called uh, Cyberphobia a remarkable, uh, clear, comprehensive and lucid uh, exposition of the growing range of threats that challenge trust in the Internet and the indispensable read map to regaining control of our online security. Why I'm quoting Michael Chertoff is that uh, I just got the email. I hope this was not a troll <laughs> uh, from Michael Chertoff uh, uh, a couple of days ago uh, with uh, his commitment to come uh, to visit us. Uh, so uh, if we stay lucky, April 18, we will have the former uh, U.S. Minister, Secretary of uh, Home Affairs here on the April, Monday. It is Monday because he cannot do it on, on Thursday uh, or Wednesday. Uh, so make uh, a reservation if you are interested. And just as the last word, I would like to thank, I would like to thank, of course, Hans Seidel Stiftung. I would like to uh, thank to the audience for uh, finding the courage to raise a very uh, intelligent and qualified question. And most of all, I uh, want uh, to
to thank uh, to our distinguished speakers, uh, Aleš Kučera, um, Tomáš Pojar, and uh, our key guest, uh, Ed Lukas. So give him one last <laughs>